Thank you very much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be, I don't know, amongst people that are prepared to fight for their country. And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. A couple things I should clear up, really, before I start. First up, I'm not Milo. And, <laughs> neither, slightly more offensively, am I Milo's mother. <laughs> Also, for the record, some people on the democratic side of things say that I'm a crap Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> I'm not her either. Actually, I'm not even gay. I just have short hair. Those are two different things. I am a straight, white, conservative female with one husband and three children under 30. <laughs> And where I come from, back in Blighty, that virtually makes me an endangered species. <laughs> I'm on the extinction sort of list, the list of animals that are due for extinction. I'm up there with the black rhino. And he has an advantage because he's black. <laughs> black lives matter, people. In fact, the threat against me has become a little bit more real of late. I've been kind of under attack myself, I suppose, as so many of us have. Only last week, a lovely lady called Madia Hara Hara. <laughs> if I got that wrong, I don't apologize. <laughs> and her partner, they're, they're British, of course. <laughs> They were in court and they were found guilty of conspiring to commit acts of terror against citizens of the UK, one of which was to decapitate me. Oh. Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Islamic Extremist 2017 had been romancing a jihadi and as her wedding gift she wanted my head on a plate. I was at the top of her list because I am the biggest bitch in Britain. <laughs> yes, I am. She bought him a hunting knife, she bought him a plastic dummy to practice his stabbing skills on and they chatted about the glorious day on WhatsApp and in a rare example of the British police actually doing the job they've been paid for instead of placating the Muslim Mafia or policing my Twitter, she has been found guilty and sent down. All right. <laughs> She is going down, and she better get used to that in the slammer that she's been sent to. <laughs> and I live to fight another day. And so here I am, and my message to you resonates with what the boys were saying. I was thinking they're a bit like the three wise monkeys, those guys, aren't they? <laughs> Except they do hear it, they do see it, and they do say it. So thank God for them. But my message is simple. Do not let this great country become the United Kingdom. Do not allow America to fall as Europe has fallen. Look at us, let us be a warning, be better than us. I've watched my country fall apart and I want to warn others before they let their country do the same. And believe me, I love my country. I'm not quick to talk it down. I was sponsored through university by the Intelligence Corps. I passed out of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst to serve my country as an army officer. We went in as a troop of 32 girls. We came out as eight more or less men. <laughs> oh yeah. It's still there, but it doesn't work that much. And I wanted to become the first female general. My, my epilepsy put paid to that. It's why I have short hair too, actually. But it brought me to the media, and so my fight goes on. And this fight is real. The UK today is a place few of us recognize. I get letters and emails, really upsetting ones, from 60 and 70 year olds struggling to make sense of the country they love. Like my mum and dad, they ask me, has the world gone mad? How, how is this all going to end up? Where does this stop? Some of them email me to say that they're glad they're old because they will be gone soon. And 
and they won't have to wait for the time they see their country fall. These are hard messages to read, and they're really hard messages to respond to. And believe me, I am wary of painting too depressing a picture. I have not come here to be part of the fear. I have not come here to talk my country down or to fail to see the good in Britain. But there are some blunt truths I believe it is my duty to tell. You are more likely to be raped in London than in New York. You are more likely to be attacked with acid from a guy on a moped in East London than in Islamabad. And when it comes to terror, the head of the UK MI5 said the risk is now impossible to contain or to control. <laughs> Serving police officers in Muslim controlled areas of the UK email me and allege that the local imam at the mosque is in charge of selecting the police officers he will allow to police his neighborhood. In a relentless program of appeasement by the establishment, they continually seem to put the lives of jihadi and the Muslim mafia ahead of the lives of our own daughters. And in the latest recruitment round for the police, white British males were excluded from the day's coaching in how to pass the recruitment day. If you were white and male, you could not go. If you were gay or ethnic or black or any other minority, then you could apply. And I have nothing against those people. But the, in the UK, discrimination against whites is institutionalized and systemic. I applied for a place for my husband just to see if he could get through. He's a male, uh, vaguely, and he's white, and they said no. <laughs> But without a minority card to play or a race card, you have no grounds for redress anymore in our country. The UK is now formed of two distinct territories. There is Londonistan and there is the rest of the UK. London and the rest of the UK, if you took Britain and spun it on its side, it is very much a baby America. London is Clinton. London is California, the bad bits and all the good bits I see are here today. <laughs> London is Bill de Blasio's New York, and he's an utter cockwomble if ever I met one. <laughs> he may be tall, but he is the smallest man I know. And then there is a better place. There is a place called the rest of the UK. There is a place where hard-working Brits want to do a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. They want to look after their families. They want to love their country. They'll fight for their country. They support Trump. They voted Brexit. Occasionally we want to have a barbecue with our families, but we can't because it never stops bloody raining. That is a good place, and it's the place where I come from. It's the place where I put my lovely husband. It's the place I put my children, and it's the place that I live in. I live in a place called the rest of the UK. And here people have grown weary about speaking out because it's just not worth the hassle. There is mass silencing of the thoughts of Brexiteers, of us deplorables, considered racist or stupid or wrong. We're browbeaten into shutting up, but they're still there. And there's a quiet rumble of discontent at the state of London, Londonistan. And that quiet rumble is getting louder. Our win for Brexit was just like your win for Trump, which I went on CNN and called a week before it happened. And that went really well. <laughs> <laughs> and when we stand together, our voices are a low rumble that becomes an almighty thunder. And our voices are heard. The quiet rumblings turn into a roar, and we're not alone. Across Poland, Italy, Austria, Germany, the voices of the discontented are rising up to reject the globalist agenda of the people that are managing the decline of Europe and letting us fall. Sebastian Kurtz, People's Party, he is also better looking than the Canadian Justin Trudeau, so take that, you lame-ass piece of crap. <laughs> the German AFD, the huge parade of patriots in Poland recently in support of national pride. You can feel the determination of the people that I talk to. I can feel the possibilities. There is hope. We do not have to watch our country fall. And there is action we can all take. There's three things I'd quickly like to run through, if I may. Firstly, 
most importantly, the same as the guys were saying, we must reject the narrative. Resist the narrative. Just because someone said it and they're wearing a uniform or a badge does not make it true. When we're scared, a strong narrative can be reassuring, like when we're little and a bad things happen and, and you run and you tell your teacher. And so too after terror. We look around for someone in a uniform to tell us what to do. These days in the UK they say, run, hide, tell. My granddad fought in the war. These were not orders that he would recognise. And in the quiet calm of our streets, when the threat is neutralised and yet another terrorist is taken down, the media machine goes into action and it's terrifying to observe. We stand united. We are not cowed. The terrorists will never win. Repeated over and over by the Muslim mayor, by the prime minister, by the chief of police, the mantra of multicultural acceptance, the same script, everything the same time every time we stand united we are not cowed we stand shoulder to shoulder and the media run around with their cameras showing people drinking cups of tea like that's going to solve the problem <laughs> the real truth is not this fabrication we do not stand united our daughters were left crumpled on the sidewalk, some lost limbs, some under a truck, like the images you had of those bikes strewn on the cycle path in New York of the Argentinians. We do not carry on as normal. Mothers and fathers are burying their daughters. A boy I know wrote to me, he's learning to use his legs again after they were blown apart at the Manchester attack. He does not carry on as normal. Others seem to carry on as normal because what's the alternative? What, what, hiding in your home? Is that defeat? It's not normal to build walls on bridges of rings of steel around Christmas markets. If this is terror losing, I would hate to see terror win. Oh, yeah. Enough of the candlelights, enough of your hashtags, enough of your heart-shaped gestures at the sky, enough of turning the Eiffel Tower lights on and off. I'm epileptic. Flashing lights don't do me any favour whatsoever. <laughs> I wrote all this, you know, in a column on Mail Online. I write for DailyMail.com and, and I, I went on Tucker Carlson. Uh, he did his best confused face. And, um, <laughs> Quit that. It's okay, you're my mate. You do not have to put on a confused face just because we're on telly. <laughs> and for the crime of this column, which was a praise of what I just said, I was reported to the British Metropolitan Police for hate crime and inciting violence against Muslims. We can reject the narrative. Two, we can commit to arm ourselves not just with the help of the NRA. Sadly, in the UK, we don't have that luxury of the Second Amendment. Our police on our streets are armed with the equivalents of a Clorox spray and a Band-Aid. Some even have a letter from their mum excusing them from gains. But we can arm ourselves with information. Information that we find closest to the source, not information fed through the liberal filters of Google or the Californian Fruit Loops at Facebook. We must look for our own truths. I spent 48 hours in the migrant camp at Calais uh, in France. It's called the jungle, quite appropriate it seems to me, where African migrants masquerading as children um, and asylum seekers fought their way through tear gas and steel fencing to break into the trucks crossing over from France to Dover to sneak into the UK. My photographer was lynched, his camera was stolen, his wallet taken, he was bitten up, uh, beaten up, um, and he went, went home because uh, he, he was badly beaten actually. I had my arm dislocated. Uh, they came for us with steel bars. We were put in the back of a van and taken out of the camp uh, to safety. I went back in the next day. Uh, I was told to cover up by the charity workers there, the, the do-gooders, the Democrats, those types, you know. They told me to cover up my shoulders because it was offensive to the Muslim men. So I stripped off. <laughs> they didn't like my tiny tits much better either. 
I met a lady uh, with a little boy, and I, and I was really, I was trying to find this quieter story, you know, real women, real problems. And her, her little boy, I was, it was the first child I'd seen in camp, and she invited me into her little caravan thing. Uh, and it turned out her little boy was in fact a little girl, except she dressed him as a boy so that at night the migrant men wouldn't come and try and steal him from her. And I learned a big lesson as well, I was naive. Migrants don't come for a new life and leave their old life behind. They bring them with them. All the old conflicts from back home. The Eritreans help, ha hate the Somalis, who hate the Afghanis, who don't speak to the Libyans. And they're still fighting. They come, they do not start a new life, they bring the conflicts from back home. I spent 48 hours in the cab of a large haulage truck because I wanted to understand the dangers of this crossing people were making. I always said, one day someone will die making this crossing because our truckers are at risk. British truckers' lives are at risk and indeed one has since died. And I had my eyes open once more. These entire truck stops run by the Mafia. Movement of migrants, ticketed, organised, controlled, lucrative. Officers at the port paid to turn a blind eye to the migrants crossing. It is much more systematic than we imagine. I travelled to Libya, to the coast of southern Italy, to join the migrants crossing over from the Med. You'll know that there's charity boats, Save the Children. Just because they call themselves Save the Children, it doesn't mean that they are. It is virtually a ferry service, and to be completely honest with you, for transparency, I would rather it was a ferry service. Hundreds of thousands of migrant men, fully aware of their rights, given places in local hotels to stay, given 35 euros a day, a sum that locals themselves don't earn. And when I carried on my journey and talked to these men in these hotels, they were blockading the road in the local village in southern Italy because their Wi-Fi was too slow. The rice that they were served was too soft. And they were protesting their rights. These are the people that come. I met with a woman on the tarmac at the side of the road in the heat. And she looked ill. She said she was poorly. She was there to service the drivers as they passed. She was trafficked for this life. And these do-gooders, remember, think they are saving lives. They are not saving lives. They are destroying lives while they're pretending to do good. And I walked the suburbs of no-go Sweden because Trump said Sweden has fallen. And the media crucified him for that. They mocked him relentlessly. I can confirm firsthand Sweden has fallen. An elderly woman grabbed me. She had only Arabic for language. She grabbed me by both arms. Wrong hair, wrong face, wrong face, wrong place. She was worried for me. She was a kind lady. I was the only white woman, the only woman, the only white in the whole of the area of Sweden that I was in, where people no longer go. And she was worried for my safety. No go Sweden has fallen to the migrants. And the Somalis still battle the Eritreans who still battle the Afghanis, just like they did in the camp at Calais. And whilst I was there, two hand grenades were found in the police station, just in a bin outside the police station. And a week later, a Muslim took a truck and rammed it into pedestrians in the shopping arcade, as you will recall. One was an 11-year-old girl. It's a curious thing, you know, how the bodies of our daughters slain by Islamist terror never make the front pages of any of the press. I interviewed a girl who lived in the forgotten suburbs because it was all she could afford. She can't go out at night. She daren't leave her home. She was burgled, but the police couldn't come because their cars are looted and torched. She said she's no longer allowed to carry pepper spray to defend herself because a girl that was attacked by a gang of Muslim men accidentally pepper sprayed the wrong guy and was prosecuted for GBH. Sat in the darkness of our home, she wouldn't even allow me to take a picture of her face for the camera before fear of reprisals by Swedish feminists who support the migrant men at all costs. In the game of Top Trumps, the victim edition, if you are a migrant, you win every time. Swedish feminists, in fact, feminists as a whole, have never been more disappointing. I fail to see how they support women. And I met the head of the toughest fire station in Sweden, who was exceptionally good looking. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> 
But once I'd moved over on that point, he was now building a bigger fence around the station to stop migrants vandalizing the engine, the fire engines, and to stop them coming in and stealing the cutting equipment, which they like to steal. I asked him whether walls like this were our future. And he looked at me really strangely. He was surprised. He said, no, it's too late for that. We no longer build walls to keep people out. Going forward, we will build walls to keep the people that we love in. And that, it still gives me the shivers now, actually. And these are my truths. These come straight from the mouths of men and women who live this stuff every day. No filter, no lens, no censorship, no Google ranking, no New York Times. And next up for me, I want to go and join the white farmers um, of South Africa who are being systematically cleansed uh, from the country by blacks there. And this way, we find our own truths. If we can resist the narrative, if we can, just by speaking to people we know, doctors, nurses, teachers, people in the street, people that have got problems, we can find our own truths. We will have the story of the people who will have the power. And then finally, the third arm of this thing is that we have to have the moral courage to fight. We have to somehow find the strength to withstand the constant attacks that we faced. And Trump is the Jedi master at this game. I love him. We know what it's like to be ostracized by friends who don't like our opinions. People can be unkind. The media can be merciless. But we all need to find the moral courage to stand strong. You know, I have battles of my own, of course. I have Mrs. <laughs> you see in my head as a prize, I've got the pocket-sized Muslim mayor of Londonistan, who's about as useful as a chocolate teapot. <laughs> There is a ruder version which involves a penis-flavoured lollipop, but I thought that wasn't correct for today. <laughs> I have a Muslim mayor that I cannot stand. He spent £1.7 million on an online hate police force to police my Twitter feed. I've been arrested for my writing. I was interviewed under caution by the Major Crime and Homicide Command uh, for a column in a newspaper. And I was referred to the Crown Prosecution Service for my commentary on life uh, because a complaint was made by the Society for Black Lawyers. I look forward to meeting the Society for White Lawyers one day. <laughs> And my family are reported to social services on a fairly regular basis. People hope that they can take my children from me, and that will silence me. The last time social services rang and said they'd had a complaint, I said, but my children at home, and my husband just made them a prawn salad, because prawns are quite posh in my family. And the guy was like, that doesn't really help. No, it doesn't. <laughs> And vexatious litigation, of course, is never far from my door. But I'm not complaining. There is no self-pity. I've put myself out there. I have to suck it up. If I don't like it, I can get home, sit on my sofa, shut up, and become a vegan. And that is not going to happen. <laughs> But resistance is key, and when we come under attack, we need to make like an arrowhead and feel the criticism falling from your sides. You know, I get a lot of emails from 16, 17-year-olds who feel like they have no voice in school anymore. They can't say if they're a Brexit supporter or if they're one of the members of Gays for Trump. They can't speak out. And I say to them, make like you're diving into a swimming pool. Feel the water coming off your sides. Feel that. Imagine that's the criticism falling off you and keep moving forward. We can keep moving forward. The liberals who reject Brexit or try to discredit Trump, they gave birth to our determination to succeed. They are Frankenstein and we are their monster and we are big and we are bad and we are coming for them. They are right to be afraid. We can do this. Yes, we can. <laughs> if only I was black, that would work so much better. <laughs> we can commit to refuse the narrative. We can commit to arm ourselves with our truth, with no liberal filter. And we can commit to have the moral courage under attack to keep moving forward. This is our time. Do not become like Britain. Get furious and fight back. Thank you very much.